you're about to witness a rare instance where Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro are in the same room, and Peterson takes this opportunity to really press Ben on Christianity, which leads to a really interesting discussion about Jesus. I'm going to let this one play out, then I'm going to get my thoughts in the back end. Let's get into it. This is where I think we could have an interesting conversation about the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. So there's an idea in Christianity, which is, I think, the central idea, which is that you need to face the potential for malevolence that exists within you and in the world. So that's Christ's confrontation with the devil in the desert, with Satan in the desert. You have to come to terms with that malevolence. That's part of existence. And you have to voluntarily accept the burden of suffering. And so that's the acceptance of the cross. Okay, so you take on that, you say the suffering, so there's an idea that Christ is a messianic figure because he took the suffering of the world onto himself. And what that means to me is that he was someone speaking um, conceptually, who decided that the suffering of the world was his responsibility mm -hmm. and that that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to decide that that's your responsibility. You take that on a bur as a burden. You do the same with the malevolence. So when you read history, you read history as a perpetrator, right? Maybe you also read it as a victim, but you certainly read it as a perpetrator. And then that's on you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then the question is, what happens when you do that? And I would say the answer is two things, is that, first of all, it starts to force you to develop, like to learn what you need to learn in the world and to absorb the information that would enable you to start to face the suffering and to rectify it. So that forces you to become a more competent person. And that's the socialization part that you thought of as so important. But then there's a secondary thing that happens too, which is that taking on that additional stress and demand voluntarily transforms you biologically because within your genetic structure, let's say. There's all sorts of potential, but that won't be unlocked unless you place yourself in a position where the demands necessitate it. And so by following that pathway, truth, let's say, the acceptance of suffering and the confrontation with malevolence, so that's the heaviest load that you could take on, then you actually produce a psychophysiological slash spiritual transformation in yourself that matures you into like the representation of the Father on Earth. That's why that that's how that lays so, itself out. Okay, so I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad he got us here because the question that I said to you, I, there was only one thing I said to you guys before yeah, we yeah. started that I wanted to get to something about most of the lectures that you're, when we're doing these things, you're usually talking about the Old Testament. Now, obviously, you're an Old Testament guy. I'm Hanvey. But my, my question was, do you think that Ben, or, or just people that believe in the Old Testament exclusively are missing something. So you just laid out a case of something that potentially is missing so there. Here's, Do you think that argue. is a fair argue. argument? Well, what I'm gonna argue is that what you just said is fundamentally unchristian in the sense that you're saying that everyone is supposed to imitate Jesus and the basic conceit of, from what I understand, uh, speaking with Christian theologians, is that we are fundamentally incapable of taking on our own sin, and so we have to have somebody who comes in the form of Christ on earth in order to accept that suffering for us, and that that is the purpose of God actually embodying himself in Christ, is to provide human beings the capacity to withdraw from original sin, that we don't actually have the capacity hmm. beyond a certain point to overcome, and that's why Jesus as a singular figure is necessary. I actually agree from a Judaic point of view with everything that you say, because for me it's about accepting responsibility for my own sins on myself, and I don't have the ability to say that there is the, the suffering servant, the suffering Lamb of God, who sacrificed himself to relieve me of my sins mm -hmm. and therefore give me a fair shot at life. Yeah, well, uh, okay, so okay, that's a, that's a really good objection, I think. And I think that there's a fair bit of confusion about that in the Christian community, for example. So I would say that that perspective is more explicitly Protestant. And then, then I would put the Catholics next to that, but then I would put the Orthodox types fairly far away from that, which is why so many Orthodox Christians, I think, have been interested in what I'm saying, because their sense, and this is where my knowledge of Christian theology starts to run out, because mm -hmm. like, I'm not an expert I'm, you know, in, the, in the doctrinal differences. Right. Um, their sense is that it's the imitation that's of primary importance. Now, mm -hmm. it's, it's a weird thing, because even in classical Christianity, you have, let, let's say, Protestant Christianity, you have this idea that, well, Christ died to save us all from our sins, and so we're already redeemed. But that doesn't alleviate the moral burden, weirdly mm -hmm. enough, because you'd think it should. So there's this paradox. And I think it's, I, I think part of the reason for that, uh, this, is, this is an extraordinarily complicated thing, but in, in, in the Brothers Karamazov, Christ comes back to Earth. Right. And... Um, in Seville during the Spanish Inquisition. And so he's 
doing his miracles and raising people <coughs> from the dead and like being all messianic. And right. the first thing that happens is the Inquisitor arrests him, right. throws him in prison, and then comes to visit him and basically says, look, um, the last thing we need after setting up this church for 2,000 years is you. You're a lot of trouble. You've put a moral burden on human beings that's too much for them to bear. And so what we've done is watered it down and put some intermediaries in place so that the moral demand that your example required doesn't just crush people into nothingness, right? So every ideal is a judge. Right. So then you have the ultimate ideal, that's the ultimate judge. And from the Inquisitor's point of view, that judge was too much. Mm -hmm. It was too right. demanding. And so I think there's an, and so, so anyway, so the Inquisitor goes through all this argument and says, we're going to have to, you know, get rid of you again because right. <laughs> you're, you're just too much to bear. Mm -hmm. And so Christ listens and doesn't, says any, doesn't say anything. And then just when the Inquisitor stands to leave, Christ kisses him on the lips. And he, the Inquisitor mm -hmm. turns white in shock and then leaves, but he leaves the door open. And that's the brilliant, uh, that's the brilliant ending of, of Dostoevsky's piece. The Grand Inquisitor, and, yeah. Yeah, and it, what makes him such a genius, because he basically says something like, well, look, the, the Catholic Church did reduce the burden, and it is corrupt in the way that earthly organizations are likely to be corrupt. And it does allow an out, which is, well, you can put your sins on Christ, let's say, and that alleviates your moral burden, but it still keeps the damn door open. Well, this and is... That's, so th this is why I think it's really fascinating, having, having spent a lot of time with Christian theologians in the past couple of years writing this book, is that the, the original conceit, I think, when, when, when you talk with people who are Christian and Jewish and you have sort of interfaith conversations, uh, the original one-sentence conceit and the difference between them is that what you hear from Jews is Judaism is acts-based and Christianity is faith-based. Christianity is about the acceptance of Christ. When you accept Christ, then you've accepted what you need to accept and everything flows therefrom. Mm -hmm. And Judaism says it's not just about accepting God, it's all these mitzvot, right? There are all these commandments that you have to do, and these are what perfect you as a human being. It's, it's the performance of these commandments, accepting God's sovereignty because he's the one who gave the commandments, but you actually have to act in the world, and if you don't mm -hmm. act in the world, then you haven't fulfilled your responsibility in the world. Th this and, could also be an argument why you could have, although I know you wouldn't be thrilled with yeah. them per se, you could have Jewish atheists in that they believe that it's just their actions here. Yes, 100%. Yeah. So, so th this is why you know Jews have had very, and, and I think most Christians believe this too, the idea of having a moral atheist is not really a difficult idea. Yeah. It's the idea of having a system built on atheism that's completely immoral and will fall apart almost immediately. And the idea of having a moral system built on atheism, if you examine your atheism closely enough, I think falls apart. I think that moral atheism is basically you separating your morality from your atheism and then ignoring your atheism in pursuit of the morality, which is, well, you can live fine that way, that's fine, but I don't think that that's psychologically sustainable um, in, if you actually examine the core of your ideas. But with, with that said, I think that Christianity, after its original millenarian viewpoint, when, when Christianity first came about, the idea of Christ on earth was that he had ushered in the messianic era because this was it was it was a new era it was a new day mm -hmm. and then it turns out that people looked around and went well this looks a lot like the old day right, right, not, right. not that much has changed mm -hmm. and so what changed what changed was our spiritual status that was the new redefinition of the messianic era is that the the what christ had brought to earth was a new spirit right he'd, he'd yep. put, brought a new spirit into the earth and he'd he'd cleansed people of their sins and given them a fresh shot at life basically yeah uh, and that in doing so he'd changed the nature of of how things work well, Judaism basically said, well, we never thought that that nature changed in the first place, right? That's, that's, that's something different. And so, ironically enough, I think one of the sources of Christian anti-Semitism over time is an attempt to distinguish what makes Christianity different from Judaism other than Christ. Because Christianity and Judaism, in most of their main philosophies, have an awful lot in common. It's interesting, I just interviewed um, a, uh, a fellow named John MacArthur, who's a major pastor, major Christian theologian. I interviewed him a couple of days ago for our Sunday special. And this came up, I asked him, so where do you think the differences are between Christianity and Judaism? And he basically said, Jesus, right? That's the difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the mostly honest answer because when I hear Christian theologians try to distinguish Judaism from Christianity, what they say about Judaism, I find to be not accurate as to what Judaism actually says, and when I hear Jews try to distinguish Christianity from Judaism, I think that, well, and I'm not saying they're the same thing, mm -hmm. because they're not, obviously, they're different belief systems, but in terms of the underlying value system, the reason that we say Judeo-Christian value system is because in terms of the value system itself, the commonalities are overwhelming. They're overwhelming. The differences are mostly doctrinal and historical, and in terms of what you think 
God, like, I, I think that Christians read back in an Acts-based version of their own lives through a variety of mechanisms, whether they say, well, predestination exists, but in order to show that if I were really elect, I would be acting this way, right? That is an Acts-based mm -hmm. version. Mm -hmm. It's just retroactive mm -hmm. from the end. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is why if you say to a Christian, so you really believe that you can lead a terribly dissolute, awful, terrible life, but if you believe in Christ with the full fiber of your being, you're going to heaven? And they'll so, say, well, and, and many of them will say, yes, but then you say, but what makes a good person? And they'll say, right, not, but if, uh, right, what exactly. they'll always add, but if you believe in Christ, you wouldn't do all those things. Mm -hmm. So it seems like Ben Shapiro, he's saying a lot of the right things here in these interviews, but he keeps squirming through the discussions and ignoring the central issue, which he even addressed. He said, it's it's Jesus. That's the distinction between Christianity and Judaism. And he keeps squirming and ignoring the glaring evidence for Jesus, which is the Old Testament messianic prophecies that predict Jesus' coming. So real quick, we're gonna watch a powerful moment where the guys at Tree of Life Ministry go to Israel and share the best prophecies about Jesus' coming to Jews. Check it out. וגם כתוב בישעיהו, מה שקראנו עכשיו, ישעיהו נ"ג, שהעם שלנו נדחה אותו בהתחלה, ושהוא יסבול וימות. וכתוב בפסוקים אחרי זה, אחרי שהוא ימות, הוא יקום אה, אה, לתחייה, ו, ואז כתוב שגויים רבים יקבלו אה, אותו, ו, והם יכירו את אלוהי ישראל בגללו. אז עכשיו, מהתיאורים הללו, מהתנ״ך, יש מישהו בהיסטוריה שהגשים את הדברים האלה? אני uh, לא יודעת. לא, לי לא ידוע. לך ידוע? יש מישהו שהגשים את זה? לא, לא שאני חושב. יכול להיות שיש, ותגיד לי עכשיו, אני אגיד לו, כן, אבל עכשיו לא עולה לי לראש. אממ... ישו. שמע, שוב אני חייב להזכיר שאני לא מאמין בזה בכלל. Some of those prophecies that you just heard read come from the Old Testament but are forbidden in the synagogues in Israel and from Jewish teachers because nobody in else in history fits these Old Testament prophecies better than Jesus. And just to drive home this point, I'm going to rapid fire real quick, share with you 10 of the best prophecies that point to Jesus being the coming Messiah. Number one, he would be born from a virgin. He would be worshipped and given gifts at his birth. His ministry would be preceded by a voice calling in the desert. He would come riding on a donkey. His message of salvation would also extend to the Gentiles. He would be despised and rejected. He would be portrayed for 30 pieces of silver. His hands and feet would be pierced. Lots would be cast for his clothes. He would die and pour out his blood for our sins, and he would ascend to heaven. And after hearing all these prophecies, who else could the Messiah possibly be? And it makes me wonder, does Ben Shapiro think that Jesus doesn't qualify these prophecies? Or does he just not want Jesus to be the Messiah? Because Jesus' message was offensive. I mean, he basically came down and told all the Pharisees and Sadducees that they're getting into legalism and not loving the Lord their God with their heart, but instead saying it with his mouth and they're not and not meaning it. And he said, Jesus said that no man is good and that no amount of sin offerings or good deeds is enough to cover the burden of our sins that we've committed against God and that we will be judged accordingly. And that the only way for us to be saved is through Jesus and trusting in him for bearing on our sins. But we're not the ones in charge of this decision of whether or not Ben comes to Christ or not, but the best thing that we can do for him is to keep praying for his salvation. So I encourage you to continue doing that alongside with me. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.